Terry Hightower was born in Winter Haven, Florida, grandson of evangelist W.M. Barton. And uh, have his wife, Vicki, is with us. Uh, has a daughter, Casey, son, Brett, grandchildren. He's preached all over the world. Too many to, uh, to, to listen or to list. He is now the preacher at the Vega Church of Christ since 2004. He's an instructor at the Spring Bible Institute substitute teacher at Boys Ranch ISD out in, that's in uh, Vega also, is it not 25 miles north? Okay. You know, one of the things that we enjoy about the lectureship is we, we meet so many good people and some stalwarts in the, in the brotherhood and we've got some outstanding people here today. One of these folks is with us today, one of whom I have the highest regard and I know that many of you have sim similar admiration. I'm speaking, of course, of Vicki Hightower. <laughs> I guess that thing, same thing could be said for a whole lot of us. So, anyway, appreciate Terry for his work's sake and uh, and for the abuse that he takes, and for the abuse that he dishes out from time to time. Terry, come speak to us. I uh, appreciate being with you today and being asked to be here once again. I always uh, do uh, enjoy it. It's uh, one thing, it's just kind of like looking out over this audience. It's just like handing me free jokes just to look at you. Um, I'm talking about mostly the preachers, of course, in the audience who are right now starting to tighten up just a little bit, I can see from looking at them. Uh, no, we are glad to be here. Uh, this is this topic that I uh, have. I did want to start out, uh, I forgot to ask the elders' permission about this, but I had already bought the book of Michael Casey, which was called The Development of Necessary Inference in the Hermeneutics of the Disciples of Christ slash Churches of Christ, uh, and this was, came out in 1986, and you had to buy it in this form, which is a Xerox type of form, and you see how thick, of course, that it is. I forget what I paid, but it was, it was rather expensive for a Xerox copy. Uh, but then I found out that the book had changed enough that this version had come out in hardback. And uh, it, I don't know whether David Brown did this deliberately or not, but this book retails for $119.95. So if you uh, ushers would get the collection baskets here, <laughs> And you know, we'll, you know, I didn't ask the elders' permission, so I guess we better not do that. But really, it is $119.95. You can get 20% off from the, the Mellon Press Company that produces it. And he changed the title to The Battle Over Hermeneutics in the Stone Campbell Movement, 1800 to 1870. This is what they call a seminal work in the sense that others have used it as a basis uh, for a lot of the false doctrine that's going on in Christ Church uh, today. They already had access, of course, to this 86 version, uh, which, from which this is how Michael W. Casey received his doctoral degree. And after reading it, he did a lot of study. I told my wife on the way up here, uh, he really did a lot of reading and study, but if this is any example, of, of being passed for a PhD degree, even in some of the uh, pretty gross typos and things, I was surprised that they let slip by. As the fact is, any of us ought to be able to get a doctor's degree if it's that easy, because it's really uh, filled with all sorts of false doctrines, all sorts of things of attacks on the church. It's uh, many times subtly done but it's still there, and then other people, like so many of the other books from last year or this year, or we could do several more, I suppose, next year and following, uh, they will lean on Michael Casey's book. And now, of course, they're quoting this one, uh, this particular expensive uh, hardback version uh, of it, in which he has jettisoned certain things. I noticed that he toned down certain things in this book, as compared to the use, for instance, of the word Campbellite repeatedly in this book. 
So, you know, they are aware of some of us. They are aware of some pressure that some of us would, uh, can and would put on them. And I'm glad that they're feeling the heat a little bit. Aren't you glad that they're responding like the last year? The response was tremendous, as you know, and has been mentioned again. I'm certain that it is uh, also uh, this year. Let me just start off by reading to you what uh, Michael Casey said when he was a child. His father was a member of the Baptist uh, Church. His mother apparently was a Christian. But I just said Casey's, this is, I'm on page 325, if I sometimes will mention a page if you have the book and you want to try to follow along a little more easily. But Casey's logical acumen is exhibited right at the beginning when he says this. Now listen to this, especially some of you young people. You need to listen up to this. He says, as a child listening to sermons, my mind would drift off to other subjects when preachers mention the, quote, necessary inferences, end quote, of biblical text. I had no idea that these mysterious inferences were uh, what they were, and the only place anyone ever mentioned them was church. Uh, Casey, if you feel that way, you guys need to get out more. Uh, inference is, has everything to do with every area and aspect of your life. And I'm going to show some of that uh, and give some examples, in fact, about it. But he went ahead and said, I also knew, and this is part of the deep-seated problem of most every one of these people that we reviewed last year and we're reviewing this year. He says, I also knew that my church was considered, no, he said, my church. Uh, that's a telltale sign right there, isn't it? But he says, my church was considered an argumentative tradition. You know, when I read that, I thought, did Jesus ever have any arguments with anybody? Did he ever have a back and forth? Was he a controversialist or a debater? Uh, what about the Pharisees? Did he ever have anything back and forth to say to them and to respond to things they ask him or, the, or even Sadducees? Or maybe a woman at the well, did he put his finger right on the, the moral problem that that woman had to, to, in essence, perhaps even embarrass her? Go and call your husband and come hither. Uh, I think of the things that Jesus did with every individual or group, even his own disciples. Did he ever scold them? Did he ever reprimand his own people? Certainly he did. And so uh, what does it mean to say that you, know, you find, are suddenly finding out that I was a member of an argumentative uh, tradition. He goes on and says, My father, a good Southern Baptist, would remind me of this from time to time. I assume as if it were bad, I take it to be good. Uh, little did I know that these mysterious, there it is again, mysterious necessary inferences were a part of an intellectual tradition that fueled the combativeness of the churches of Christ. You want to be a member uh, of a wimp, wet noodle church. It shouldn't be the churches of Christ that are following the New Testament. In fact, it won't be, will it? It cannot be because that is not how uh, the Bible teaches it. We are to be a militant uh, uh, group of people with marching orders, not being ugly and just uh, divisive for the sake of being, you know, ornery with people as sometimes some of us are accused of. No, but we are to follow Jesus. We are to follow the Apostle Paul. And just right there, if I stopped right there, uh, were they not combative with people over the truth of the Heavenly Father? And the answer is, obviously, uh, yes. The fact is, I'm a member of Christ Church uh, because uh, that it is combative in the true biblical sense, the New Testament sense of that, of following our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and following the uh, inspired uh, apostles. Now, what this book is all about, I'm having to boil all of this down, but let me just say, you know, what's happened here, these people uh, jump on the fact of what they call C-E-N-I, and some of them now are adding the S to it. That just means command, example, necessary inference, C-E-N-I, all capitals, and now usually they're putting in, I'll put this in the book, uh, capital S, which means the silence of the scriptures are prohibited. Do you still believe that? Or do you believe that the silence of God through the silence of scriptures is non-prohibitive so that if it doesn't explicitly condemn something, you can do it? Uh, well, think about snorting cocaine. Where is that explicitly in the Bible? It's not there. Uh, it's not explicitly there. 
but it's there. Uh, and I, I would say, and I, I answered this in the book, and I don't have time to go over it now, but uh, Casey is simply dead wrong to elevate uh, necessary inference, or what he really should call, you could say necessary, or just say implication, up to be the big booger bear of the brotherhood and something that is so horrible and, and terrible they can just hardly uh, bring themselves to even think about using it, you know, on their own uh, and, and doing it themselves. Although the fact is, like I show in this uh, chapter, I show they all do it. Everyone is going to use implication one way or the other. And the primary thing, like Brother Thomas Warren used to say to us years ago, say, where is your name in the Bible, brother or sister? And it's not there. You're only in the Bible by implication. And so if you use any verse uh, to talk with someone and say, well, this is what you ought to do or what you ought not to do, what you should restrict yourself from, you are involving yourself in inference, which occurs in the human mind, from the implications of God uh, through the scriptures. Uh, and you cannot get to first base about anything uh, without uh, inference. Uh, the, it makes me wonder, you know, in thinking about uh, Michael Casey in that uh, he's, you know, he is mysterious inferences. Uh, inferences are, are not something to be looked at as some sort of a, a mystery religion or something that God has, you know, uh, put in Scripture, certainly, and then given his view, uh, just something that we as mere finite humans have invented and then actually impose or superimpose upon uh, Scripture. It's just simply uh, not that way. It makes me wonder what these people do read. Certainly they're not reading all the materials that are available out here now uh, from those who are not members of the church, but who have certainly caught on in the last, say, I'd say 25 or 30 years in many great books. I've listed some of them in the back uh, for uh, your use. As I said, uh, Michael Casey and all these new hermeneutic type people uh, need to get out more. Let's put a few overheads up here right now, and I wanted just to show you a little bit about what is said in this book. Is it? Is that front switch something wrong with it? Okay, just try. Uh oh, is it plugged in? Can we check it down there? It, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we better not do it. We'll we'll really uh, mess up there. Well, I'll just make faces to make up for it, uh, if you can handle that. Uh, I wanted to mention here at the beginning again some of the areas that, that this is involved in. We put some, a lot of these things, everything pretty well that I'm mentioning, will be in the book, of course, and we cannot cover anything like what is in uh, the book. But what is the definition of inference? What, is the, what does that word mean uh, to you? What is that, uh, you know, you could say all about? Well, let me just define it. By inference, well, you got it going again. It's probably the switch back there in the wall or something where it's plugged in maybe. Well, notice here on this one then, abandoning the hermeneutic of common sense. And this is a quote, and we're calling it challenge number one. For the practitioner, he says, of restoration theology uh, in the Stone Campbell movement, by the way, that's all that we are to him. It's not a matter of saying this is the New Testament church that you can read about in your own Bible, but it's just simply we're part of this Stone Campbell, and it's simply a human movement like the Mormons uh, and other so-called pietistic groups that are trying to go back to first times. Uh, notice here, he says, the most serious question this study raises <laughs> it is a blank. We'll go back to my faces again. I want to just, let me go back to inference. I want you to hear this. By inference, uh, the definition of inference is uh, it is the process by which one proposition is arrived at. I just means a statement. Uh, proposition is arrived at uh, and affirmed on the basis of one or more other propositions accepted as the starting point of the process. And then to determine whether an inference is correct. The logician examines those propositions that are the initial and end points of that process and the relationships between them. It's just simply a matter, you know, of thinking. But let me say to you, in all kindness to these people, uh, and as you know, I've attended some of these schools for degrees myself, but the fact is, if you're ever asked the purpose 
of religious studies department or something like that. They don't usually call them Bible department anymore, and they well shouldn't. At least they're being a little more accurate now. Uh, the, in our Christian colleges, if you're ever asked the purpose of a religious studies depart, department in one of our Christian colleges, just respond this way. The main goal is to deprive people of their common sense about inference and to destroy the Bible as a meaningful and authoritative guide for mankind. That's, that's what they're all about. And so, parents, you better think about that before if you were to even remotely begin to think about allowing your child to go to one of these schools. In some ways, it's better just to send them to a state university and say, these people are anti-Bible. They are out to get you. Uh, rather than send them to a quasi-institution that supposedly, you know, has, of course, Christians in it who are going to take care and, and, and further the faith of your uh, daughter or your son. Uh, the fact is, especially in the Bible departments, uh, there's some serious, serious problems here found uh, within. Notice then on this challenge one, I just want you to notice especially this part, is the ra validity of the rationalistic restoration hermeneutic. They get confused between being rational or having adequate evidence for conclusions which you draw as related to uh, what I mentioned a minute ago concerning propositions or statements, certainly especially out of the Bible, but they, uh, the two challenges, he says, faces the tradition. That's all we are is a human tradition. Uh, the entire Enlightenment project and its epistemological foundationalism are under attack and have been discredited in many academic circles. That means there's some fads and gimmicks that are coming along cyclically every few years, and they change their positions about all kinds of foundational things. That's all. I'm just paraphrasing it and explaining it to you, but that's really what this is all about. Uh, so the normative vocabulary of American common sense philosophy, they say, is at the root of all of these problems. I have three books. If you want to look at them, I bought them just because they said uh, how bad they were. Uh, and there's the three, and one of these was used at Bethany College uh, for years. Co uh, Alexander Campbell used this book, and they've all been reprinted, and they've been reprinted for a reason, because there's some good stuff in here. But this one was used at Bethany College, and then Robert Richardson took over, and uh, uh, Campbell's biographer, and he took over, and he taught the logic classes at Bethany College. And this is where Casey, in his 1995 tome here, uh, takes all of this to task. But notice, it sa he says, given the extent the restoration hermeneutics is grounded in the enlightenment, and the normative language of common sense, it's called common sense philosophy, tied in with a man by the name of Thomas Reed and others. He says, uh, can an alternative restoration hermeneutic be constructed? What he's doing is deconstructing anything to do with what they would call command, example, necessary inference, and that silence of the scriptures is prohibited. And so they're setting it up for themselves to have come forth. This book came out, I believe, in 80, uh, no, the original one, in 86, and then this one just a little bit later, and he sort of has refined it uh, just a bit. Let's see, I was thinking, I have it, it's documented in, of course, your chapter there, 1998, that's what I was thinking, 1998, uh, and they are attacking uh, everything that any of us would hold dear and that's why we tend to get a little bit bothered and upset about some of this, especially when these people claim to be scholars and they do not do uh, homework like they should be doing. Put the next one up, Gene, if you would. And this is, again, just a quote uh, out of his book, and I'm still calling it The Abandoning, Abandoning the Hermeneutic of Common Sense. Uh, the entire Enlightenment project and its epistemological foundationalism are under attack and have been discredited in many academic circles. The norm he said that a minute ago, the normative vocabulary of American common sense philosophy has also been discredited. And that just involves the thing of where we would say, well, yes, direct statements do authorize certain things then out of the Bible, either in a restrictive or prohibitive way, or they authorize the thing in a positive way. And, uh, and on certain terminology that we would use and say, yes, some examples are and do have binding authority, such as, for instance, you remember Acts 20 and verse 7 to do with the Lord's Supper, and verses like that. 
or I haven't seen them give up the example yet, by the way. Have any of you? If you have, let me know about it. I'd like to hear about it on 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 about the preacher's you know, salary and getting his money out of the collection plate every Sunday. That seemed to be still part of the pattern as far as I can tell, even though they discredit pattern it, Pattersonism uh, in, in other areas, you see. They won't on that one. Go to the next one, if you would. Okay, he says the second challenge is that the tradition uh, hermeneutic of command, example, necessary inference, that's not precise enough, and I deal with that in the book. A lot of Brother Warren and other brethren's material, some in this room, have written concerning that. I know David Brown has, several of you have, uh, and explain this in a much better way. These people just act like we haven't read anything, we haven't studied anything, we haven't made things more precise when in fact we have. But he says is not found in the Old and New Testament. If I was going to pick one thing out of his book to say this is what it is all about and, and an attack then on inference or what he would call necessary inference or what we would commonly call implication, that's where, that's where it's all about and everything in his book is tied in uh, with this. He says, but it's grounded not in the scripture, you see, and he's trying to convince people, young and old, that this is the truth. Uh, he says it's grounded in the human history of Reformed theology, Scottish common sense philosophy, in other words, all coming from men, and logic, he said, and the 19th century American culture. He said it is not a divine hermeneutic insulated from the chaos of history. Well, wait a minute. Is his insulated from the chaos of history? I guess his is. Is his divine? The new hermeneutic that they are uh, foisting on our brotherhood is it uh, divine? Has it dropped out of heaven? I'd like to hear the explanation of that. You see, he's entrapped in his own scheme here when he's trying to do away with the truth, really, about direct statements being binding, about examples, both positive and negative, uh, being binding, uh, and implication binding things in Scripture. Uh, I remember as a child hearing lessons to do with Acts 8, 35, and 36. Look at it in your own Bible. Don't you remember something about this where it says he preached unto, verse 35, he preached unto him Jesus? Uh, and then it says, he, he came to a certain water and says, here, he said, here's water, behold, what's in me be baptized. And putting two and two together, and that's basically what logic is, is to say uh, preaching Jesus includes saying something about, explaining something about water baptism. Uh, I understood that when I first heard it, as far as I know. I don't know exact age. I was baptized. I kind of waited a little bit till I was actually 13 years old. But I knew what I needed to do before then. But the fact is, imagine saying that it's just a tradi the tradition hermeneutic of command, example, necessary inference is not being found in the Old and New Testament. So there's no implications in the Old Testament. Uh, uh, 39 books and no implications uh, and he never draws any I have some of them they've applied some of the Old Testament verses to me after they claimed that nothing to binding except what's in the New Testament and then they said it was only direct commands and then he turns around and he'll use something from Proverbs or someplace and say you're a sower of discord brother Hightower he's using the Old Testament and he's getting me involved, and the only way he gets me involved in any verse, including the New Testament, is by implication. My name, Terry Hightower, is not in there. And even if you found Terry Merle Hightower, I'm going to say that's a guy over in Africa somewhere. <laughs> and it doesn't apply, you see, to me. I mean, how foolish can you get? Uh, it's, just, it's just absurd. Go to the next one, if you would. I want to give some real practical examples here, and I hope you'll read the book. But, you know, pardon me, but I'm going to go this route. This says underneath, for those of you that can't see it, it's comforting, this old man says to this girl here with him, after putting those on the board there, he's obviously like, a, I guess, a professor or about to retire or has retired. He said it's comforting in one's later years to know that the old truths still apply. About a 90-degree angle <laughs> It's still a 90-degree angle. Uh, two plus three is five, or has it changed with a new hermeneutic approach? Uh, four into eight is two. Well, that may seem trite to you, but really, 
Uh, do you know anything? Do you know anything? The fact is, like, and I have put this in uh, the book. I believe it's, uh, I forget the exact page, page 369, I think. And this is what G.K. Chesterton said about this. If you want to read with me, if you have your book. Uh, it's where uh, he was the famous Britisher and author and everything. And he said, uh, his name is G.K. Chesterton. And here's his conclusion that what we suffer from. This is back a few years ago. He saw this coming. He's dead now. But he said that uh, it's the putting humility in the wrong place. He said, modesty has moved from the organ of ambition and settled upon the organ of conviction. In other words, what do you really believe and know to be the truth? What would you give your life for? He says, where it was never meant to be. A man was meant to be doubtful about himself. In other words, would I do this? Would I sacrifice myself in warfare or for my family uh, or my wife or husband or whatever? He says, but, but to be undoubting about the truth. Jesus said in John 8, 32, what? You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And then here's what Chesterton said, and you may have heard this quoted before. It's a well-known quote. He says, we are on the road to producing a race, now think of this, a race of men too mentally modest to believe in the multiplication table." I don't know, if, if you're leaning that way, that should insult you. And I hope it does, because it ought to rattle your cage enough to say, you know, two times two is still four, two plus two is four, two plus three is five, four into eight is two. Those things aren't changing. Uh, and you know it. Or are you going to just say, well, I'll just hold that tentatively for the rest of my life. I don't think so. Are you, are you too mentally modest to actually say, I know that baptism is essential for the remission of alien sins. Uh, for anyone living today who has, sinned, uh, who has sinned, they must be baptized in water, immersed in water, for the remission of their sin. Uh, you see, this is why you see all the different divisions. If you cross the country today, it used to be years ago, if you went from one church of Christ to another across the country or even around the world, uh, you had the same basic, you see, teachings, but not anymore. You have every type and stripe uh, of person. Do you, are you really going to be willing to throw out uh, implication, or in other words, what we would call necessary, or in, just call it inference? Uh, I hope not. I hope that you're not even, even remotely thinking to go that uh, direction. The fact is, I've shown in, in this uh, chapter, we've shown the fact of how it applies in every area. Let me just hit a few of these. If we don't get any further, that'll be fine because I went different ways of how I was going to approach this today. But really, I just want you to see how silly this whole thing is about this so-called new hermeneutic. What about in science? Uh, can you infer things and know certain things in, like, say, human anatomy? So pretend you're in human anatomy 101, and my teacher, if I was in there, tells me to measure the height and foot size of two class members, and I do so, and I empirically find out that Brother Dub McClish is taller with longer feet than, let's say, Dave Watson. And as an additional fact, another student finds out in that class that Dave Watson uh, is taller with longer feet than Johnny Oxendine. He's back here at the corner if you want to look at him. Uh, what, what else do we know from putting together the known facts that I just gave you? In other words, inducing and deducing. Uh, without any more measurements. In other words, what do we know by logical extension or implicitly from the givens that I just gave you? Do I know that Dub is taller than Johnny? Uh, are his feet longer than Johnny's? Remember, we just said Dub McClish is taller with longer feet than Dave Watson, but Dave Watson is taller with longer feet than Johnny Oxendine. Do you know Dub's feet, that he's taller and he has uh, longer feet than Johnny Oxendine? I don't know about you, but I know that from those first two facts, just like some of this stuff. Uh, if you say yes, then I'll say congratulations. You do not hold the view of Michael Casey and other new hermeneuticers as to mysterious implications, what he should say, but he calls them mysterious inferences on that issue. So my instructor, let's say, pretending, now has Dub and Dave and Johnny to perform an experiment about melting down some uh, different substances. And using exactly the same heat level, we learn that dub substance A melts down to a smaller bit of content 
than Dave Watson's substance B, and further, that Dave's melts down to a smaller content than Johnny Oxendine's substance C. What else do we know about then? By implication, without it being explicitly stated, in other words, in so many words. Do we know that Dub's substance melts down to a smaller size than does Johnny's? Yes, yes. By the simple induction of certain facts and then by deduction or inference, I now know that Dub McClish is tall with big feet and has little substance. <laughs> Most of us already knew that from watching and hearing Dub speak, of course, but we're trying to be scientific here today. And we don't want somebody claiming mere subjectivism, you see, on our part. But the fact is, uh, there, there, I will add this, there is no meter or way to measure it, however, which could possibly scientifically measure these three guys' ugliness. Uh, well, well, we'll go on. In, 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 in legal matters, I give a whole scenario. Be sure and read that. Uh, I lifted that from another lecture I had given a few years ago at another place. But in legal matters, do you want lawyers and judges, especially judges, or a jury to not use things about implication or inference? Uh, what, what is uh, DNA all about? Uh, what are fingerprints all about? You weren't there. You didn't see the crime. But aren't you willing, because of uh, uh, corroborative evidence that proves beyond a shadow of doubt that this person is guilty and did this crime, they were there, and they have certain inferential type things of evidence, don't you see? And I give an example of that in which uh, a young man would have spent the rest of his life in prison if you operate like a new hermeneutical. That's just that pure and simple. You must use some reasoning here and, and induce facts, put them together, and draw conclusions. The Bible, of course, in Psalm 119, verse 160, in the American Standard Version says, The sum of thy word is truth. And that's what you must do. Jesus did it in Matthew 4 with the devil. Uh, the devil quotes scripture. Say quotes from a certain book here from Psalms. And what does Jesus do? He quotes from another book as it says, Again, it is written. Do you know that's the exact thing that many of these new hermeneuticers say that you ought not to do. You can't do that. You can't put the Bible together and induce putting verses together that way. Well, you can do it wrong. You can, you can infer things that are not there, certainly. And they like to play those up. Uh, but the fact is, uh, even when they conclude that, they have inferred that. I would say about all of this, in Romans chapter 10 and verse 2, uh, would be a basic description uh, and being kind to these individuals. And just to say like Paul did about his Jewish uh, brethren, he said, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. But what's the rest of it? But not according to knowledge. They haven't studied in the area of logic enough to really see what it's all about and how they are using it to end up trying to refute it. Uh, you have to use all the three laws of thought, uh, the law of excluded middle, the law of identity, and the law of non-contradiction. You have to use all those to even get a, a foothold to even start to try to refute what they call the old uh, hermeneutic. Are we going to just end up throwing education uh, throwing out uh, critical thinking skills. That's what you have to do, and I have a whole section on that. Uh, in home life, okay, let's say you're real stubborn, and you're saying, Terry, I just don't see what you're talking about, about implication. Uh, okay, so you still refuse to accept the fact that implication and inference is crucial to your life. Let me let you do this then, and this is right in the book, so you can take it home and practice it if you want to. Then I say this, try the following. Tell, husband, uh, tell your wife, say this, Dear Nancy Pelosi is lower ethically than a snake's belly, and your mother is lower than Nancy Pelosi. And watch what happens. <laughs> she will infer, and she'll infer probably correctly, whereupon you better be in the car headed down the road away from her. Because she put it together, what you were implying, you see, about her mother. Or, uh, ladies, try this one. Let's turn it around on you. Tell your husband, honey, you and those other idiots are being stubborn. <laughs> Just wait that one out and watch him. Of course, if he's watching football on TV and starting to fall asleep, like some of you probably are right now, he you know, may not do anything. You know, He won't get it. 
But just because somebody doesn't get it doesn't mean the implications there, and that's what you better see about God. He has said, he has implied in this word, uh, uh, and, and he has made the implication, whether you or I, whether any of us in this audience make the incorrect inference off of it ever at all. Uh, there are people who go through life, and some of our own teenagers grow up, and they don't ever see it to why they should be baptized in the Christ. Okay, go ahead. It's the, the implication from God is still there. Jesus still said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, didn't he? Truth is truth, it's objective, certainly if its source ultimately comes from God, and we are under obligation to do uh, what he said and only what he said. We must obey these things because, and I have a chart up here that Brother Warren drew years ago. I've made copies of it. I think some of you picked, up, picked it up already, but I, I hope that you'll take a copy. There's, an, there's two charts up here. Uh, you cannot get away from this. There's simply no way that you can get away from uh, implication. Uh, at all. It has to be there. Uh, I'll tell you what, if you're really still stubborn now and you're going to say, well, I just don't get this thing about implication, Brother Hightower. I don't get it. You know, God implying you're saying, and then, or the Bible implies things, uh, the Word does, and then uh, humans have to infer or deduce, you know, what the truth is and so forth. Well, I'll tell you what, you just get in your car and drive out to an airport and go up there right in front of the security personnel and look them in the eye and say, quote, the Arab underwear bomber was bad news, but I promise you and everyone boarding this plane, I'm badder. Now you say that in front of them. <laughs> you just say that in front of them, and they will make some inferences very quickly about you. In fact, there will be inferences you will not like that will not be pleasant. But oh no, inference doesn't, nobody can tell. Uh, Brother Casey and others, it, it's like you can't figure it out. Nobody can make heads or tails of it. And then he's inferred that, don't you see? He's giving you his inference about all of that. So you're still inferring, and you're just inferring in an ignorant way. That's all that boils down to. Uh, well, and I said this uh, when Doug Post, I wish he were here, uh, I said when Doug Post proposed to his wife, Debbie, he did so by way of implication. He said, darling, how would you like to be buried with my people? <laughs> now, now, some of you young guys over here, you need to think that one out a little more, you know, and get your mother to help you a little how you ought to propose. That's usually not the best way to do it by implication. But, and of course, in, in, uh, unfortunately, Debbie inferred the correct implication, and it was, uh, she went ahead and said yes anyway, only, of course, to be in deep regret later after she tied the knot with Doug Post. Well, you know, I, I, I add this about Debbie in her defense. I said, who can blame Debbie for reading Brother Warren's keeping the lock in wedlock once a week? She does. She reads it once a week trying to find some way to pick the lock. <laughs> Uh, okay, here's another area, in music. I know you're interested in music. Everybody likes music of one sort or another, and inference and implication is involved in that. You can't understand the song lyrics without recognizing implication. What about the meaning of the words to just a couple of songs by Tony Orlando? Tie a yellow ribbon around the what? The old oak tree. Uh, uh, and then another one, I would say, knock three times on the ceiling. If you want me, twice on the pipes, if the answer is no. Yeah, there's some people ignorant enough, like Gene Hill running this projector over here for me. He reverses it around, you know. Instead of not three times on the ceiling, he just hits twice. And then he did the three, you know, uh, on the pipes. But just because Gene missed it there doesn't mean that you have to. And you, and you don't have to miss it like Michael Casey has missed it in 119, did I mention that? 11995 <laughs> book. Uh, I want to talk to you later, David. Uh, uh, that first song, Tie a Yellow Ribbon Around the Old Oak Tree, that's contingent upon deductive reasoning. Uh, and where the man coming home to his wife from three long years in prison, and he says, if I don't see a yellow ribbon around the old oak tree, I'll, what, stay on the bus, forget about us, put the blame on me. Uh, and, the, and the song ends up saying, of course, now the whole bus is cheering. He said, I can't believe I see, what, a hundred yellow ribbons around the old oak tree. That's just pure and simple, a deductive thing. 
Uh, you see, it was a nonverbal communication between them. He wrote it to her to tell her that's what he wanted her to do if she wanted him to get off the bus and stay. And she obviously did. She went overboard, I mean, generously, you see, uh, and put more. She put 100 yellow ribbons around that old oak tree, which leads me to believe that they had dumped all the new hermeneuticers off the bus at the last rest stop. Uh, the, and the same thing about the, that second song, not three times. You, you get the gist of that. What about in English uh, literature and grammar? The foolishness of the new hermeneutic warped view concerning implication uh, slash inference is the fact that without its usage, one can't even know that anywhere, think about this one now. This is so simple. You open your Bible to Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. You read here where it says he, and you know from studying the immediate context that that he is a reference to our son, uh, God's son, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It says he did thus and so. You know, he walked on water. It didn't say Jesus walked on water explicitly. It said he. It used a pronoun. According to the new hermeneutic warp logic, you don't know that Jesus did that. Because you had to reason and know that he was referring to Jesus Christ. Don't you see that? Is that, that uh, like Mac Devery always asked all of us about things? Is that so hard? It's not hard in this case. Max made things hard because of his false doctrine. Uh, but the fact is, think about, think about the metaphors, the similes, the allegories, the riddles, the parables that make up the Bible. Uh, irony, uh, personification. Anthropomorphism, uh, hyperbole, synecdoche, where the part stands for the whole, or the whole stands for the part. There's eight souls were in the boat, but we know there's not just an ethereal soul floating around there. That stands for those eight people, including their bodies. But you know how you got that? You deduced it. You deduced it. It didn't explicitly tell you that this is a synecdoche and this stands for the whole human being. You have to reason with it. And by the way, it's the same thing that you do with the daily newspaper. Basically, it's the same pro uh, procedure when you take up this book and you read it. You know, you don't, hopefully, you don't, you know, uh, uh, look in the obituary columns when you're wanting to read the funny papers. Uh, you, there's a reason and rhyme to all of that. And all of these rules apply, you know, again, across the board. And you cannot even do figurative language is what we're saying without uh, reasoning here or even the personal pronouns, he, she, it, and even just about Jesus Christ surely shows you the seriousness of it and also the foolishness of it. Well, uh, in humor, I guess I'll have to close with this one. Uh, but, and, and again, uh, ho we're all hoping you will read our chapters. Uh, in humor, this is the only one area in which I'm forced to agree with the new hermeneuticers and that's when my brethren say or do strange things in my presence. This includes a lectureship director addressing the gathered crowd like this. Can you ever even imagine Brother Terry Hightower saying at the end of his speech, words fail me here? <laughs> the crowd laughs just like you did, but I don't get it. A, a fellow preacher with whom I work used to lean around me and look behind me and yell, yeah, he's in here. And I would go out, you know, and look for somebody, and there was never anybody there. What's going on? Well, the uh, fact is, uh, uh, one brother presented me with a T-shirt one time at one congregation, and it said, I started to wear it to show it to you, but I uh, sighed against it. It said, in huge letters, it said, help, I'm talking, and I can't shut up. And the brethren at that congregation laughed just like you did. And again, I don't get it. Which is to say, I'm with Michael Casey about this thing. Well, put up that, the very last one, the borough there. We'll, we've got to stop here. Uh, well, there he is. Now, you remember what he says in that? You remember what about the borough rides ad there for a certain credit card and so forth? Uh, this basically describes the difference between us folks and a new hermeneutica. The new hermeneutica guy is the one holding the burrow right there because it said burrow rides and he didn't get the implication. <laughs> That's exactly right. Look at him. And yet the the, all the clues are there and they're in the Bible too. Notice this. There's a saddle right there. 
uh, and there's a saddle on that donkey back there behind. You see the telltale clues there, certain things here on the table, a bridle and so forth. He's got the credit card. You think he's really paying so that he can, in the heat of the Death Valley there, haul that burr all around on his back? I mean, I'm being absurd, obviously, here about some of these things, but it's not absurd when you're dealing with Scripture because we have to reason. This guy didn't. He says, no. You know, he said, don't you remember the ad? He says, no, we ride them. That's right. That's a correct uh, deduction. Uh, that's a, uh, he's even induced. He's put facts together here. And, and so forth. And because just the sign, but see, a new hermeneutic can get confused. Or he'll, worse, he just says, it doesn't matter. It does not count. It doesn't amount to any real importance there. That's why they are saying now, if you want to use instrumental music and worship to God, don't worry about it. That's okay. That's just you. You've inferred that. Other people deduce it another way, but don't let them, you see, uh, get you shook up. What we should do is, is use our mental uh, facil faculties. The mental faculties of the human mind, the power to think, to discover, to wonder, to imagine, are precious gifts of God. The brain is a wonderful organ. Uh, it starts working the moment you get up in the morning and does not stop until you become a new hermeneutic. I were looking for this book and found this same one. It was a hundred, what did you say, 1995. The implication would be I wouldn't have bought it. <laughs> you, put, you put the donkey down there. <laughs> what can I say? I, I, I'll just leave it alone. <laughs> I, I, one, one of those other, other songs popped into my mind there, Terry, but when you go and you travel away like that, does, does Vicki sing that song? It says, when you're gone, I feel so bad. It's almost like having you here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you stop to think about that whole basis of music. It goes away. If you take, if you take right. implication away, it, it just it fails. Yeah. It, it just goes. Anyway, well said. We'll stand adjourned now till the top of the hour. Thank you, Jerry.